send that to you after the meeting if you just uh, maybe Lisa can put my email in the chat and also this will be recorded um, and we'll put out pieces of it. Okay, so Ypsilanti is a black city, part one, roots of a historic community. What you're looking at on this front picture are um, a photo uh, of uh, students at Ypsilanti's officially segregated first board school. So Ypsilanti had officially segregated schools until 1919. The building that these children were taught and learned in is still there. It's right next to Brown Chapel's AME Old Church on South Adams Street, uh, and it is now also a church. And we'll learn quite a bit more about the First Ward School, both in this and in the next chapter of the story. Okay, at least we have eight people waiting in the waiting room. Okay, so before Ypsilanti, and uh, yesterday was Indigenous Peoples Day, so I think it's important to remember that we're talking about Ypsilanti history, and Ypsilanti begins on this river in 1825. It's a little less than 200 years ago. People have been living on this river in towns and villages and camps and uh, uh, any uh, number of multiple different ways for about 12,000 years. So uh, I think it's important to remember that the land we're talking about, Ypsilanti is only here because the native people, including the village that was here, probably near Galt Village in Ypsilanti, were removed in a series of wars by the United States as uh, it, it, um, it, the first wars of the United States after its founding were to take control of the Great Lakes, the Ohio River Valley from native people. And we often think about native resistance happening out west, uh, you know, Custer and Little Bighorn and all of that. But the most important and the most substantial uh, resistance uh, to American settlement uh, by native peoples was in the Great Lakes and Ohio River Valley. And this river would have been the headquarters of native confederacy during Tecumseh's war, uh, what we call the War of 1812 in this area. And uh, native groups were actually able to take Detroit from this river. You see that Indian village there and another Indian village sign there along with the, the <coughs> early uh, land divisions here. And then uh, also important to remember that the US Army in October 1814 came up the Huron River and destroyed the villages and cornfields of uh, the native uh, people here who were largely Potawatomi, not exclusively Potawatomi, but at the time that the Americans arrived into the Huron River, they're largely Potawatomi. And this place was probably called Maguago's Town. And uh, the descendants of Ypsilantis, uh, or the people who lived here before Ypsilantis, some of those descendants lived just 90 miles away, uh, southwest of Athens, Michigan, which is just south of Kalamazoo. And they refer to themselves as the Nottawa Sipi Huron Band of the Potawatomi. I do a whole talk on that. But I think it's important that when we talk about Ypsilanti, we remember it's a very small part of the history on this river. Okay, so let's talk, <clears throat> let's go into slavery and freedom in the Detroit River. And I think one of the things we have to remember is that Michigan is settled by, or not settled, but Europeans arrive in Michigan about a hundred years or so before the United States arrives in Michigan. So there is a European uh, uh, town, Detroit, uh, everybody knows Detroit is a French town. Uh, there are far more Native Americans around Detroit than French people, but we call it a French town. Uh, and uh, uh, during the French and British period, the French imperial power and the British imperial power both controlled Detroit, not much more outside of Detroit than that. Um, but about 10% of Detroit was enslaved. Uh, in the early French period, uh, about half of the enslaved population were Native Americans from out west, Pawnee people, uh, and uh, uh, about half were people of African descent. Uh, during the British uh, rule of Detroit, uh, almost exclusively the enslaved population were people of African descent. I think it is quite likely that the first person of African descent to see the Huron River was enslaved. Uh, either uh, in the French regime or the British regime. There was a trading post here on the Huron River, and I guarantee that those rich owners of the trading house did not hump the furs back and forth up off of this river, but had enslaved people do it for them. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that people of African descent would have seen the place that is now Ypsilanti a generation or two before Ypsilanti was ever 
uh, imagined. So I think that's also important to remember. There was somebody of an African descent on this river before the United States was here, okay? And I and, and possibly well before that as well. Um, uh, uh, the Northwest Ordinance outlawed slavery in the Michigan Territory, uh, but there's a huge caveat to the Northwest Ordinance about slavery. And does it, that caveat is there's no new slavery, right? But if you're already held in bondage in the Northwest Territory, you can be continued to be held in bondage. And so we have individuals who will have been uh, enslaved in Michigan well into the 1830s from Michigan. And then beyond the 1830s, if you were an officer in the military, uh, you would bring your enslaved valet with you. So the Fort Wayne, the, the forts that dotted the Michigan landscape, the officers in those forts uh, uh, would have brought enslaved people with them. So all, literally up until the Civil War, there would have pe been people enslaved in Michigan, a small number of people, but people enslaved in Michigan. The Detroit River becomes a border, right, when that Canada, United States things happen. And really interesting, um, both of them had a law saying no new slavery. So you actually had a situation where people were escaping from Canada in the, to the United States to get away from slavery, and they would be waving to people escaping from the United States to go to Canada. So depending on your legal position, you went one way or the other on the Detroit River. So what we think of now is you have to just get across the Detroit River uh, to freedom in Canada was actually a two-way street in the early days. That closed down after uh, uh, the British Empire outlawed slavery entirely uh, uh, with the big caveat of India. Uh, 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 people start beginning to go to Canada relatively early in the 1830s. So before the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, people are going to Canada, and that's largely uh, uh, free Black people as well as people uh, escaping slavery. And free Black people are escaping the virulent, hostile, violent racism of the United States and the Black Codes. Um, so Black Codes are in Michigan, and Black Codes were laws that were designed to... Um, to really keep black people from this territory. So black codes were in all of the northern midwestern states, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and the black codes were things like you had to have white people sign for you to say that you were a good citizen. You had to give $500 bond when you entered the state. Uh, you had to do all of these sort of pledges and stuff like that. You couldn't vote. So there were many, many restrictions on not just your civil liberties, but your right to own property, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, your right to vote. Uh, and so these black law, the black laws or black codes uh, meant that many people who had found refuge in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, found that refuge to be increasingly hostile. Michigan uh, did have black codes early, um, uh, but they were quietly repealed in 1838. So it did mean that Michigan had less restrictive codes on free black people than many other states around here. Uh, Michigan becomes a state in 1837, right? So the United States takes Michigan in 1796, 13 years after they were supposed to because Native American resistance here. And then it's 40 years before Michigan becomes a state. Michigan becoming a state is dependent on slavery. Slavery is not a uh, Southern institution. It's a national institution. So we're all having discussions now about the Senate and the filibuster, and this goes back to that. And so uh, in our Senate, uh, in the, the compromises they made with the slave owners and the founding of this country was that, that the Senate would be a place in which uh, the slave owners would have outsized authority, right? So, uh, you know, um, two, two senators from each state and each state that comes into the union for each free state a slave state has to come into the union, right? To make sure that there aren't more free states than slave states and the slave owners will continue to have the monopoly of power in the federal government. So it actually takes Arkansas becoming a state before Michigan can become a state. So even Michigan becoming a state of the union is dependent on slave owners in Arkansas becoming a state. That's what we mean by a national system, right? It's built in, baked in, to the foundations of even our municipalities, how we create states, organize ourselves. Slavery is outlawed uh, in Canada and most of the British Empire on August 1st, 1834. That date, August 1st, will become the most important uh, 
day in the calendar of Black Ypsilanti for generations and generations and generations. Black churches uh, in Detroit, the first Black church in Michigan, so the oldest Black institution con continuing in Michigan, is Second Baptist, which is in Greektown in Detroit. Uh, that was founded in 1833. Bethel AME in Detroit was founded in 1839. And St. Matthew's Episcopal Church in Detroit were founded in 1846. Both Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti had pre-Civil War Black churches. Uh, both of, uh, Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti's pre-Civil War Black churches continue to exist, like the Black churches of Detroit. They were Baptist and Episcopal. Hello? Can Sorry I, okay. about that. Sorry. I muted you. That was my fault. Keep going. Okay, okay. so um, Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor, both have pre-Civil War Black churches. Both of those churches are still in existence, both in Ann Arbor and and. Um, uh, uh, Ypsilanti. And any, as historians know, in the North, before the Civil War, there were about 200,000 free African Americans, free Black people in the North before the Civil War. There's about four and a half million enslaved people of African descent in this country in the South. So a, very, a relatively small population in the North. So if you have a pre-Civil War Black church in the North, as a historian, I immediately know that you have an important Black community, right? Uh, uh, and, and certainly you have a, a, a spot on the Underground Railroad and the struggle against slavery. Selene, believe it or not, also had a pre-Civil War Black church. Selene, 150 years ago, had more Black people than it does today. That's also a different story we can talk about. Um, uh, 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 but Selene was also a center of some Black population. And then there were rural, um, a small rural Black population here in Ypsilanti, uh, which we'll talk about. Uh, in Washtenaw County, and then the most important uh, large rural Black population in in uh, Michigan, which was mainly an urban or town dwelling population, uh, would be in Cass County, uh, in Southwest Michigan, which had uh, large uh, was in in fact some townships in Cass County before the Civil War were majority Black population farmers. So that's that is quite something. Okay, now also uh, Detroit streets. When we think about Every town has streets named after slave owners, including, of course, Ypsilanti. Ypsilanti has, every single town in America has a Washington Street, a Madison Street, a Jefferson Street, right? All of the founding fathers who were slave owners. Uh, and we tend to think of places in the South as having streets named after slave owners. You know, uh, Robert, e., you know, and we're talking now about taking down statues and things like that. But many, many, many of the streets in Detroit are named after slave owners because we name streets and places after wealthy people. And wealthy people in this country in its beginning owned, along with land, other people. That's what it meant to be wealthy in this country, own land and people. And uh, so the wealthy people in Detroit who have streets named after them, we will not be surprised to find out that Macomb, Compo, Bobion, McDougal, Abbott, Brush, Cass, Hamtramck, Goyne, Meldrum, DeQuinder, Beaufay, Grosbeck, Livernoid, and Rivard, among others, are slave owners. Not Southern slave owners, Detroit slave owners, Detroit slave owners. Uh, the woman here you're seeing, uh, Lizette Denison Forth, uh, was born in 1786. Uh, she died uh, at 80 in Detroit, and she was born enslaved in Detroit. There's a, a, a story about her. her. There's a, a number of good books. Uh, one recently came out. Uh, by Tyra Miles on um, the history of slavery in Detroit, which I, I very much recommend. Okay, and we're gonna continue. Okay, so earliest days here. Again, 10% of Detroit is enslaved. We have a trading post here. The first white landowners in Washington County were the people who owned that trading post. Uh, and they were the Godfrey family. Uh, now, they didn't live here in Washtenaw County, they just owned land here. But it is important to remember that the first white people to own land in Washtenaw County, the Godfrey family, were slave owners when they owned that land, right? When they owned that land. Um, uh, the Godfrey family were an extremely wealthy family uh, um, in, in early Michigan. Uh, again, they did not live here. People were not, as far as I know, ever enslaved on this land. Uh, uh, living here. 
Um, as far as I know, that never happened. And it would be hard for me to imagine a situation um, where that would have happened because this was a Native American area. The first black person that we, we do know uh, with absolute certainty to be in what is now Ypsilanti, because we even know the date and time. It was May 14th, 1825, when the first uh, territorial elections were held for the Michigan Territorial Assembly. And so everybody in Washtenaw County in 1825 came to the old trading post, which is where Riverside Arts Theater uh, Center is now on North Huron in, in Ypsilanti. And, you know, everybody who lived here, meaning everybody who could vote, which were white men over 21. And it's in um, Michigan had property qualifications for some votes and not others. And I can't go into all of that, but not all white men would have been allowed to vote either, uh, depending on the election. Um, uh, you had to have wealth to be able to vote for, for, for a number of things early, depending on, again, the election. Um, and... Edward Matavy uh, uh, attempted to vote in 1825 for the uh, territorial election. And a man named George Meldrum got up in Meldrum Avenue in Detroit and said, Edward Matavy should not be allowed to vote because Edward Matavy was born a slave on my father's farm in Detroit and is not a free white man. So I think that should underline Ypsilanti history. The first black man we know about in Ypsilanti was born enslaved, not in the South, did not escape to freedom in Ypsilanti, but was born enslaved in Detroit, and he was denied the right to vote. All right, that's the first black man we know of in Ypsilanti, born a slave in Detroit, denied the right to vote. His name was Edward Matavy. The name is spelled multiple different ways. I have tried desperately to track down some more history on him to no avail. The area uh, is settled now. The, the people who buy the land in the beginning are quite different from the people who settle the land. Those speculators who are buying all of the land, then they're going to sell it to the settlers and make a big buck, right? Uh, and so the people who settle this land to actually come here to live are a little bit different. And, and by the 1830s, people are really coming into the Michigan Territory because the... Um, the uh, Erie Canal has opened up and there's transportation finally to be able to get to this part of the interior of the continent. Uh, and uh, uh, so people who are coming to settle in Ypsilanti are largely coming from upstate New York places and places like New Hampshire and Vermont. So they're coming from the area of what is now the United States that, that had, it, it absolutely had enslaved people. It absolutely had slavery in its economy but perhaps the, the least impactful slavery in North America at the time. Slavery was not predominant in the economy. The economy did not depend on enslaved people, at least the local economy did not depend on enslaved people. Uh, and, and the vast majority of um, uh, people of African descent would have been freed in the years after uh, the revolution. And uh, so what that meant is that the people who settled at Slanty come the white people who settled from Ypsilanti come from an area with the least amount of slavery in the culture. They also come from that, the Burnt Over District, which is the area of upstate New York in which there were multiple religious revivals. And those religious revivals were around the Methodist and Baptist congregations, just like in the Black community. And it, it was called the Second Great Awakening. And it was this millennial moment uh, in religious Christian thinking that said that we had to cleanse the society of its sins to prepare for Jesus's return. And those sins included things like slavery, alcohol, child labor, all kinds of things, right? And so it didn't necessarily mean that people were taking progressive attitudes on all of these ideas, but it did mean that these ideas were up for discussion among this community in a way that was probably more so than many other communities. The first African people of African descent to settle permanently in Washtenaw County come exactly with those white folks from upstate New York. They come as farmers, they come as free people, they come not as poor people. In fact, we'll, we'll see, they become some of the well, some of the earliest landowners in Washtenaw County are African Americans and they're some of the wealthiest landowners in Washtenaw County. It's, it, you know, um, in 1830 or 1840, it's likely that, that black people mo owned more land in Washtenaw County than they did in 1900, right? Uh, so that's one way to think about it. 
Um, uh, the, the, so this area contained a socially active community. The other very important element to this is the normal college. So what we now call Eastern Michigan University was a normal college and a normal college is a teaching university and it's the first teaching university anywhere west of the Appalachian Mountains. And a teaching university attracts women, right? It's the only kind of university that will attract women in this period because if you're a woman and you want to go to university in 1850 and you have the money to do it, your options are doctor, lawyer, engineer. No, you have one option teacher, right? One option, teacher. So you're going to go to a normal college. So uh, middle-class women, educated women from all over Eastern uh, United States come to Ypsilanti to go to school to become teachers. And just like you become a teacher today, people don't become teachers to become wealthy, right? You become a teacher because you're committed to education and all of these kinds of things. So you, you have the normal college where you have uh, women, educated white women, largely middle class, who are going into the teaching profession, and they don't have the right to vote or get divorced or own property or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when you have a situation with extremely educated, you know, rather privileged, well-off women with no rights, they will begin demanding their rights. And, and so the normal college also is a place where these things are discussed where rights are discussed because the the not the majority of the uh, students at the normal college but the 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 part of the student group that the college is focused on are women and and so it has a different kind of role than u of m who wouldn't see a woman enter that door for 40 years right uh, there's a relatively small black population here oh the, also important to remember the first white the first anti-slavery society of any kind that we know of in Michigan is the Logan Female Anti-Slavery Society started by women. And, and women are, uh, women enter politics in the United States for the first time on a mass level in the abolitionist movement. And we'll, we, we see, including black women, and we see that again and again. Also, people are attracted to the Raisin Institute, which is in, in Adria. It's not that we think of Adrian now as kind of a very white, kind of perhaps a little hick town, but Adrian, believe it or not, was by far the seat of radical Quaker abolitionism in this area before the Civil War and many important, nationally important abolitionists um, uh, were active in, in Adrian and just outside of Adrian in a little place called Raisin Center, a community that barely exists anymore, was a radical Quaker uh, school. Uh, co-educational school for black uh, uh, men and women to learn mechanical skills, to learn all kinds of skills. Uh, and so many people were attracted to that. So there are, there are institutions in this area that are also attracting black people as well as uh, Canada close by attracting black people. Okay, so look at these. So if anybody, I wanna make sure people can see. So this is 23 textile and carpenter Road and so these three farms in the 1830s uh, are so the, the the first black the first landowners in in Pittsfield are black people and they are the Array family the Brooks family the Day family and a couple of other families who only stay around for a little while before moving on so these three farms there was a, a kind of farming community called Carpenter Corners around textile and carpenter that was uh, largely African American. And people were, almost, I think all of these families are from upstate New York. Uh, all of them were free for a generation or two before they came to Michigan, again, except John W. Brooks, who was actually had to fight for his freedom. His um, owner tried to keep him uh, uh, against the law in New York, and he actually fled out here. And I'm, I'm eager to know how did he get the money to buy this land? Uh, but he is an incredibly important person. So these three farms were established in the 1820s now. So remember, Ypsilanti or Washtenaw Black history begins with Washtenaw County. These are the first people, the, the first Americans to settle on what was Indian land. And they're Black people. Uh, and, and so th that history goes all the way back. These are not small farms. These are not sharecroppers. These are, are rather wealthy farmers owning hundreds of acres of land, hundreds of acres of land. And they're not allowed to vote, right? They can't uh, uh, serve on juries. They can't give evidence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have people who play a social and economic role in society who cannot play a political role in society. 
So the day, uh, like many of these, these all, again, these are families are from upstate New York. So Ypsilanti's early black history, well, there's not a southerner in it. And you, you won't find it for 30 or 40 years. Almost, almost exclusively early black Ypsilanti is from the north. Uh, um, John W. Uh, Brooks was born enslaved and freed after New York's anti-slavery law forced the hand of his owner. Involved in the anti-slavery and black freedom movements, all three of these farmers, if we look down here on the right, all three of these men, the, the, the patriarchs of these farms, were delegates to the 1843 Michigan Colored Men's Convention. And you can see Washtenaw County. Look at all of the delegates Washtenaw County has compared to other places around that. And you'll see the names, Reverend Brooks, Asher Array, Nelson Ockrey, William Smith, William Hardy, John Riggs, Thomas Freeman. All of these men, uh, outside of Detroit, the largest contingent of delegates to the uh, um, 1843 Michigan Colored Men's Convention, and they got together to demand the demand that they would have for many years. Uh, 120 years before the March on Washington in 1863, black men in Ypsilanti and Pittsfield in Michigan were demanding that the word white be removed from the Michigan Constitution. This is a seminal event in black history in Michigan. And you'll be happy to know that the African American Museum uh, in the new year will be having an exhibit on our participation or Washtenaw's participation in, in this uh, historic event. Okay, so abolitionism in Washtenaw County. Um, when we think of abolitionism, we tend to think of white people. Now, uh, what percentage of white people were abolitionists in this country? A very, 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 very small percentage of white people were abolitionists. And an even smaller percentage of those abolitionists would have been a, the kind of abolitionists who would have supported equal rights for black people and full, full participation in society for black people. So a very small percentage of whites have that position. What percentage do we think of black people had that position, right? 99%, so 1% white people have that position, 99% black people have that position. Why in the world do we think of abolitionism as a white-based movement? I don't know. But abolitionism and the anti-slavery movement and the Underground Railroad are overwhelmingly products of the black liberation struggle. They are not the products of white progressives, as important as those progressives, and some of them died for this cause. We don't want to take anything away from them. Uh, but they were following the lead of black people. They were not leading them. And I think that's really important to remember. If you were black and escaping slavery and you came to Ypsilanti, the first place you would go is not one of those wealthy white houses on River Street. That's the last place you would go. The first place you would go is the black church that was founded by other people who had escaped from slavery. Why this is hard for people to to kind of imagine, I don't know, but when we imagine the Underground Railroad and the struggle against slavery in Ypsilanti, for some reason it's in a white person's basement or attic that people are hiding. That's where we imagine the Underground Railroad happening, rather than the actual community who has escaped and is living right next door to you. Uh, so uh, um, being anti-slavery did not mean being pro-black. So the Norris family here in Ypsilanti, with the exception of a the correctly named Justice Norris, but we have the Norris family, there's a Norris Street. Their, um, their house is even listed as being a, on the Underground Railroad. Absolutely not. They were colonizers. They, they wanted black people to return to Africa. They were opposed to slavery because they didn't want any black people in America at all. That's why they were against slavery. So even after the Civil War, the Norris family uh, uh, is part of a colonizing movement to get black people to return to Africa. Uh, so they were not abolitionists. Uh, Justice Norris absolutely was. Uh, whites in this area, such as the Beckley, Chase, Glazer, DeGarmo, Moore, McAndrews family, absolutely were involved. Uh, many, the Moore family, the DeGarmo family are involved up to here. Uh, uh, black families like the Arrays, the Days, the Stewarts, the Acros are involved, as were churches. See, remember, this is an underground, underground. There are not a lot of things written about it. We're not going to know about it secret societies and many more unnamed for some reason, which it, which people know about, uh, which I don't know about, but Carol Mall has written a book about Salem Township is the rural center of abolitionism here. Uh, the African-American population uh, increasingly predominant in within the local abolitionist movement 
as black people become uh, a higher percentage of the population here. Nearby Detroit is an absolute center of black activity. We all know Harriet Tubman was able to free dozens. Um, the group in Detroit headed by William Lambert and George de Baptiste with close connections here to Ypsilanti, a group might've been called the African Mysteries or the Order of the Men of Oppression, were instrumental in freeing thousands of people, thousands of people. Um, uh, black people could not vote or participate in politics as white men could. So remember, you know, to be an abolitionist as a black person, what does that mean? You vote for the abolitionist party in elections? What does it mean to be an abolitionist? How, how, do you, how does your abolitionism, uh, uh, inter, you know, uh, 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 relate to the fact that you can't do politics the way that white men can do politics? Right. So even even the kind of framing of the questions, who do we vote for? Well, that's a question for white people. That's not a question for black people. Right? So how to struggle is different in the black community and the white community. There are, of course, uh, places where they overlap. But by and large, the black community uh, is uh, working with white people, working with allies, but at the same time, keeping independent organizations going. So like that African Mysteries, like the Black Churches, like the Prince Hall Masonic uh, uh, Lodges. Okay, I know that I have to keep going up, but it's important to remember that one of the most important um, abolitionist newspapers in the United States in this period was uh, made in Ann Arbor. It was called the Signal of Liberty. And there's a big, there's lots of divisions in the abolitionist movement. The main division in the abolitionist movement is between those who thought uh, that the Constitution offered a way out of slavery and those that thought that the Constitution codified slavery and we needed something besides the Constitution. So you can imagine that's a pretty big debate, right? And so uh, the people like the Signal of Liberty thought that the Constitution would uh, be able to, and so did Frederick Douglass eventually, thought that the Constitution would be able to be used to stop slavery. So let's vote, let's get a political party, let's do that. The other side said, no, the Constitution is a pact with the devil, literally. A pact with the devil because it's a compromise with slavery and we want we want nothing to do with it right so you have real divisions within all abolitionists black and white different divisions among black folks than white folks but you do have real divisions about as you can imagine about uh, how to overthrow slavery in this country lines and borders the underground railroad in the landscape we have all seen these wonderful maps that show the little lines in the landscape where the underground railroad is I'm gonna share a secret with you. These are all BS. These lines are just how anybody would get from point A to point B on that landscape, right? So they, they do give you a visual sense of the Underground Railroad, but this is not the Underground Railroad. It's not like you could make it to Cincinnati, look at your watch, the Underground Railroad is gonna arrive and you'll get to the next station. That's not at all how this thing worked. It was very much ad hoc. There, there were absolutely networks that worked with each other, but those networks didn't know the people working with each other next door. And sometimes those networks were around to get three people free and then just kind of collapsed after that, right? So a mat remember, this is a dynamic movement. This is not um, a formal organization, the Underground Railroad. There's nobody organizing this thing nationally. There's no tickets you can buy. There's no place you know you can go to get on the Underground Railroad. That's not how this works. But what is important to look at this map is where are people going, right? Everybody's leaving from the South to go North, the North Star, and they're going to Canada. And one of the things when we think about the Underground Railroad, we tend to think about it as the act of uh, assisting people who are escaping, right? That's how we tend to think about the Underground Railroad. It's not even the act of escaping itself. It's the act of assisting those who escape. And if we tell the Underground Railroad story that way, then white people can be at the center of it. But that's not how the Underground Railroad worked. Right? That's not how people escaped from slavery. Nobody was on a plantation in Alabama and got a postcard saying, congratulations, you won an all expenses paid trip to Canada. Your rich white philanthropy friends will be there to pick you up in the morning. Please dress warm. That's not what happened, right? The people who escaped from slavery made those decisions. They're the ones who decided which white people to trust, which white people not to trust, which black people to trust, which black people not to trust, to go east, to go west, 
to go north, to go south. The person escaping slavery decided that, right? Not the person aiding them, right? Uh, and again, I don't want to give anything away from the people who aided. Many black people aided other black people. That was an essential component of this. But they're only aiding people who have escaped themselves from slavery. It would have been impossible to aid people who, who had not escaped, right? And so when we even think, when we even use the term for the Underground Railroad about the people escaping slavery, we call them passengers on the Underground Railroad. We've all been a passenger in a car. What do you do as a passenger in a car? You just sit there and somebody drives you and you maybe take a nap, turn the radio on. That's not how the Underground work, Railroad worked, right? You were your own conductor. You drove yourself to freedom. Right. So even the kind of phraseology we use for this uh, obscures the reality of it, the reality of it. But what is important to look at in this map is if you're going north to Canada, how do you get there? You've got these Appalachian Mountains. And remember, Harriet Tubman is over here. So she's not going to cross these mountains and come over here. She's going to go up this way. Right. Up this way. So if you were enslaved in this area, likely you went to Canada this way, through Niagara Falls and that kind of thing. But if you're anywhere over here, well, are you going to go up through here? Well, no, this is Ojibwa territory. You're not going up through there. How in the world? There's not a, even a road up to here yet. So there's one or two places you can cross into Canada. And Detroit is obviously the main one. So what, what happens is Detroit is the choke point. It's where everybody, not everybody, but many people from all over the Western, what it was then the Western part of the United States escaping to Canada would have to go through. So if you were trying to tax somebody escaping from slavery, where are you gonna go? Detroit, right? So Detroit also has a slave pen. There are all kinds of ruffians and thugs and soul stealers walking around Detroit armed looking for people and there's all kinds of black folks walking around Detroit trying to protect themselves and looking out for the slave hunters right so Detroit is a violent revolutionary uh contested area it is one of the few cities in the north to have a slave pen, and that is because so many people are trying to get to Canada uh there and and, and there will be numerous riots and, and things like that around slavery in Detroit. And more than one time, uh, people were caught and put in jail and the black population of Detroit uh, freed them and got them to Canada before the sheriff even knew what was happening. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, again, the North Star. The, the pro process of the Underground Railroad is a process to freedom, right? It is not to escape slavery. You are trying to get free. And freedom and being not a slave are two different things. As we talked about with the black codes and racism, just not being a slave does not mean you are free in the United States, right? And also escaping slavery, does that mean that you will never be enslaved again? Does it mean that if you escape slavery that the person who owns your mother will go, oh, your mother can go with you? No, no. So you escaping slavery does not ensure you will not be enslaved again, does not get your parents or children free, does not end slavery. So getting free individually was one step in the struggle to destroy slavery. But until you destroyed slavery, you weren't actually free. And the idea that your children were gonna be free, no way, right? So what you see in Canada are both free blacks, and people who have escaped from slavery, uh, uh, establishing communities where they can have something like self-determination. Because where people are going is to where they can determine their own lives. They can have black teachers. They can get away from white racism. They can have some semblance of authority over their own body, right? And, and you couldn't do that in the United States. You could do that in Canada. Uh, not to say Canada was free from racism or anything like that. It was less violently and legally racist than the United States, though. And it meant that Black people could vote, Black men could vote. It meant a Black woman like Mary Ann Shad could start a newspaper called the Provincial Freeman. Henry Bibb, who escaped from slavery, could start a newspaper called the Voice of the Fugitive. Those newspapers are not in Detroit. They are in Canada. 
So these communities in Canada become sort of revolutionary hives of activity, kind of like um, Casablanca or something like that, you know, free, free communities. And, <coughs> and you can tell that there's a very big division within Black people who've escaped from slavery or racism in the United States over how to relate to Canada. These two newspapers, the two main Black newspapers in Western Ontario at the time, and you can tell that they have very, very different attitudes towards what to do. So this Voice of the Fugitive, edited by Henry Bibb, we're fugitives from slavery living in Canada. We're fugitives. We're exiles. We want to return from to the United States. The provincial freemen, led uh, by Marianne Shad, is we're free in the province of Ontario. We're staying, right? So there, there's, there's a big difference between... Even, you know, there's not one black community. There's not one black experience. There's not one black way of looking at this. I know that's obvious, but sometimes we need to underline it. Okay, so those communities are include isolated farmstead, rural villages, and neighborhoods and towns and cities. So Chatham, Ontario was called the Black Paris in the 18, or the Black Paris of the mid, uh, of Ontario in the 1880s, believe it or not. Now I think Chatham is three or 4% black population, but at a time it was 20 or 30%. And of course, it's where John Brown would go to try to recruit for Harper's Ferry. Uh, schools, newspapers, churches, fraternal and benefit groups are established. Close ties to Michigan. That border is means freedom and uh, slavery, right? The, but there's no border between these two communities. So the same preachers, the same families. When you got married, you might go to Buxton, Ontario to look for, you know, a husband or a wife. That That is... Um, uh, how close these communities were. And by 1900, nearly every Black family in Ypsilanti would have some relationship to Canada, whether they were born there, their parents were born there. And Black families went back and forth to Canada, especially a town called Buxton, which is about the sister city of Canada. Uh, to, to this day, homecoming was just held in Buxton and Black Ypsilantians whose families have been in this area for 150 years would have traveled to Buxton, at least before COVID would have traveled to Buxton to go to that. And I think it's important to remember that these communities, Don, Dover, Chatham, Buxton, uh, Colchester, are about as far from Detroit across the Detroit River as Ypsilanti is, right? So they're just on the eastern side. And uh, as when COVID is over and you can freely or as freely as we can travel these days to Canada, I highly recommend a day trip to Chatham, to Buxton, to Don, uh, to uh, uh, Amherstburg, to Windsor, Every town I just mentioned is smaller than Ypsilanti except for Windsor, and each one of them has an Underground Railroad Museum about their experience. Why in the world do we not have an Underground Railroad Museum about our experience here? Okay. Uh, the founder of Brown Chapel AME Church is Isis Stewart, uh, and she has escaped from slavery. And this is a wonderful story here. Uh, I want to just quickly read this, and I know that we're, we, we have... I'll try to continue to go quicker. But Isis Stewart uh, escaped from slavery in what is now West Virginia. Remember, Virginia split during the Civil War between the slave side and the not so slave side. Uh, and she was born uh, in Western Virginia, so right across the Ohio River, right? So not what we would think of as Virginia, you know, on the coast in the, in the tide water or something like that. And it's important to remember this, this article comes out in about 1905 in Ypsilanti. And already, Isis Stewart has great grandchildren living in Ypsilanti. So already we, by 1905, we have generations of people in these families that have, have grown up in Ypsilanti. And Lee My McQuan, the proprietor of a coop line, has two relics of slavery days that he, coop line is like a taxi service with horses. Uh, 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 he drives, uh, he prizes very highly. So there, he, he was never held in slavery. He is holding these items his grandmother had brought with her when she escaped from slavery. Well, you know, after she's dead. It has a history connected to his grandmother, Miss Isis Stewart, who was a slave in Virginia. She was a determined color woman who, when she ran away, said she would never be taken alive. She had a particularly narrow escape in Reading, Pennsylvania, where the slave hunters were on her trail. They even came to the house where she was, but the disguise given by her friends helped to mislead them. At another time, while in the mountains, she met five panthers. Panthers do not travel in packs, but that's okay could exaggerate a little bit. She always kept the corn knife with her and she would have used it if necessary. The other relic is a corn haunch used on the plantations. 
This she used very effectively one night when 25 showmen surrounded her house in Ypsilanti. So there was a racist assault on this woman's house in Ypsilanti. When she refused them admittance and they threatened to break down her house door, she rushed for the horn and from the second story window gave some blasts on it, which made the showmen think the day of Jubilee had arrived. It is reported the way the men tumbled over each other to get away was the most lofty tumbling ever seen in Ypsilanti. What a wonderful uh, article. But that gives you a sense of this woman who would not be taken. She's the founder of Brown Chapel AME, right? So when we think, who are the people who founded Ypsilanti's Black community? They are these kind of people. A Black woman who escaped from slavery who would not be taken alive, who founds a church and becomes the matriarch of an important family in Ypsilanti, right? Okay, where are people coming from? Who came to Ypsilanti and from where? Did people hide here, stay here, live here? How many people and how did they get to Ypsilanti? When did people begin fleeing slavery through or to Ypsilanti? What groups and families might have been active in the Ypsilanti area? Well, here are some names of families and, and some of them will be very familiar. <clears throat> some people on this call may even be related to these families or be of these families. These are family names in Ypsilanti uh, who have been here since before the Civil War. Morton, Griffin, Davis, Stewart, Hamilton, Jacobs, Casey, Crosby, Kersey, Rickman, Bass, Beatty, Neely, Robinson, Travis, Lowe, Stafford, Scott, Augusta, Brown, Cunningham, York, Washington, Bell, Johnson, Sherman, and many more. So let's, this is where people are saying they're coming from in 1860. And look, and so on the top uh, uh, pie here, we notice that about one quarter of all people say they were born in Canada. They're lying. Many people were born in Canada, but if you get up in 1860 and say, I was born in Canada, it takes, <laughs> it takes the question, were you or are you a slave off, off the question table. So you just go, no, I was born in Canada. And many of the people who say they were born in Canada in 1860 and 1870 will say, I was born in Tennessee or Kentucky, right? So saying you were born in Canada is a way of shielding yourself from slave hunters or from the threat of slave hunters, even if you weren't. Uh, fleeing from, from slavery. Uh, but that Canada thing is important. There are certainly people by 1860 who would have been born in Canada in the last 30 or 40 years who came here. Uh, Michigan is about 18, 15, 18 percent. So again, there is an existing population that goes back to the earliest days of Washington County. It's a small population, but of course it continues to grow and expand. Uh, and, and that Michigan population is here. And we see other northern uh, there. And other northern, we're talking about Ohio, Illinois, Indiana. And don't think that people were coming from like, you know, a, a, a neighborhood in Cincinnati. They were coming from black, those communities that were like the communities in Canada, but they were along the Ohio River. They were overwhelmingly black. They had black churches. They were black, not refugee communities, but refuge communities, both free black and people escaping slavery. And these served as the center of organizing anti-slavery activity in the Underground Railroad. And many of these communities in the aftermath of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, which meant it was very hard to be black in America if you were free, many of those communities picked up lock, stock and barrel. Whole churches got up and moved to Canada. And so Detroit lost a huge percentage of its black population after the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act as people moved to Canada. Um, and then we see people in slave states. So about a little less than half of people in 1860 claim to have been born in a slave state. That doesn't necessarily mean you were born enslaved, especially if you're from North Carolina, where many, many free African Americans came north with white Quakers to Indiana and then on to Canada. And many Ypsilanti families uh, have roots in North Carolina. They were free black families in North Carolina who left after Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831 and the white reaction to Nat Turner's rebellion to both free blacks and to white abolitionists. So you saw a lot of Quaker, white Quakers and uh, black people move out of North Carolina who were free in the 1830s. And they all moved to Indiana and then Indiana got really hostile and they moved to Canada and then they moved to Ypsilanti. But it is possible to trace these families through the landscape like that and the same community, the same families will be living next to each other in North Carolina, then Indiana, then Canada, and then uh, Ypsilanti. So these communities are 
moving around together as communities, moving around the landscape. Okay, so who's born in slave states? Where are those slave states? It will surprise nobody. If you are trying to escape from a plantation in the delta of Louisiana to Kentucky or to Canada, it's far harder than to escape from Kentucky to Canada. You don't, you know, from Louisiana, you have to go through half a dozen slave states. It's a thousand more miles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's no surprise that we see the vast majority, the, the largest groups of people from slave states are going to be from those states that are closest to Michigan. So Kentucky, Virginia, because it's Western Virginia, uh, uh, the Carolinas, you see, those are those that community from North Carolina largely. And the Deep South, this is the Deep South. There are some people who are able to get here from the Deep South, but very, very few. So Missouri and Kentucky would be the overwhelming number where people are coming from. So generally, when I'm looking into people's past, where did they come from? I, I'm, I'm pretty safe to look into Kentucky uh, uh, here. Okay. A few of Ypsilanti's freedom seekers. I have dozens and dozens of these articles. Uh, these are mainly obituaries about people who were uh, either born in slavery um, or escaped from slavery and came to Ypsilanti. Uh, and you can see all the stories in these. So seven of his children sold from the slave block. This group here, this picture here is Isaac and Lucy Berry. And many of you will be able to notice this is an interracial couple. What in the world? Isaac Berry was held in bondage in Missouri, uh, and Lucy uh, was a neighbor of his. She was not a, from a slave owner. She was from a very, very actually poor white family. They didn't own other human beings. Uh, they were a very poor white dirt farming family, and she li lived next to the plantation that enslaved this man. They fell in love, which could have cost them both their lives. So how do you get from Missouri to be together, <laughs> right, when you fall in love? Well, they couldn't travel together. So what happens is Isaac uh, walks from Missouri to Canada and Lucy takes the train and they're gonna try to meet each other. And they did. They were able to meet each other in Puce, Canada. Uh, Isaac escaped through Ypsilanti. And when we have a story about him walking the railroad through Ypsilanti and he actually gets shoes and socks and some money from Ypsilanti's black community to get him to Detroit across the river where he will meet and reunite with Lucy. Um, after the Civil War, they will return to the United States, um, but they will move with a couple of other interracial families about as far away as you can get from prying eyes and hostility. So the, the, these group of interracial families from just outside of Windsor, uh, who is, many of them who escaped through Ypsilanti, will, will move to the, the woods of Macosta County in northern Michigan and have a interracial settlement up there in the woods. And Isaac would become the first postmaster of that settlement, one of the first black postmasters in Michigan. And Lucy would become the first teacher in that settlement. And uh, uh, that settlement is called Pleasant Lake up in Macosta County and their descendants still live in that area. And I was extremely honored to be tasked with writing the historic marker for the Little River School um, uh, up there where they are. So that's one of the many many stories. Each person who escaped from slavery has a story, has many stories. This is one story. Imagine how many there are. Okay, so H.P. Uh, Jacobs is Ypsilanti's Reconstruction leader. I do want to give an example of another person who escaped from slavery, and that's H.P. Jacobs. Uh, many people may have seen this mural, which is on uh, Curry's Barber Shop on Harriet Street on the south side of Ypsilanti. H.P. Jacobs was born enslaved. His, his slave name was Samuel Hawkins. He was born enslaved in St. Clair, Alabama uh, uh, County, which is just northeast of um, Birmingham. So he was born in the mountains of Alabama, not the lowlands of Alabama. He was probably, probably, but we're not sure, the, um, we know who his mother was. It was Mary Dill, an enslaved woman, and, and probably the foreman or son of the owner of, of the family uh, impregnated, probably through rape, his mother, uh, and, and he was born on the plantation, the, the Dill Plantation. And he was considered too small to work in the fields or perhaps his biological father kept him from working in the fields. But in any case, he was able to learn to read and write. He wrote that he was tasked 
with uh, taking care of a crazy man. And I thought, oh, this is just a story. And I looked into it. And yeah, we even know the man's name. So there was an older white man who had some sort of mental disability who H.P. Jacobs took care of as a kid. And in that process, he learned how to read and write, which was illegal. He could have gotten him killed. But uh, at 36, he's lived on that, or in his 30s, we're not exactly sure his correct age, but in his mid-30s, we're not sure how long he had been planning on it. He's married on the plantation. He has children on the plantation. His family is together um, uh, on the Dill plantation. He is able to forge his freedom papers for himself, his wife, his children, and his brothers-in-law. And they steal or expropriate the uh, uh, master's horse, horse and cart and make it to um, from St. Clair, Alabama to the Detroit River in 20 days. So they moved, they moved. So he used his, ed his education as a tool of liberation. At the Detroit River, he is baptized by William Troy, a very famous black, uh, um, uh, local black preacher, Baptist preacher. He's baptized in the Detroit River the moment he escapes. He sheds his slave name and takes the name H.P. Jacobs. And Jacobs is his wife's name, wife's name. So he's taking his wife's name and all of his female daughters, his children, his female children will continue to use hyphenated Jacobs in their last names as, as they, so we think of that as a modern feminist thing to do, but these are black women doing that in the 1880s. And at first I thought it was to honor their father and now I'm pretty sure it was to honor their mother. So they're retaining their last name as an honor of their mother, whose name was Louisa. And Louisa Jacobs was the partner of H.P. Jacobs, uh, all of his efforts. And the reason we don't talk about her is, one, she was a woman, so she doesn't get to vote and be all of these things and the leader and all that. But she also dies young. So he will live for 30 or 40 more years after Louisa dies. So he's self-emancipated uh, with his wife and family. Uh, he will become the janitor at what is now Eastern Michigan University. The most, the best job for a black man in, in uh, Ypsilanti at that time was the janitor at Eastern Michigan University. You lived on campus. It was a state job with a regular salary at an institution of higher learning. It was considered, for a black man, the best job you're going to get, right? It, was, it had the most prestige. So, um, so again, is it possible in Ypsilanti that the leading figure of white Ypsilanti would be a janitor? It's impossible. There's no way in the whole history of Ypsilanti, that the leading white figure of Ypsilanti was a janitor. It was some wealthy mill owner, always. But the leading figure of black Ypsilanti is often a janitor. So there's a class difference between black and white uh, 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 in terms of how those communities are structured. And that's gonna play a role in the kind of demands, needs, and interests that these two communities have, right? Uh, so uh, he enrolls his daughters uh, Anna, Jewel, Lita, and Mary into uh, what is now Eastern Michigan University's Music Conservancy. And they will be the first black women, I think the first black people at all, to graduate from what is now Eastern Michigan University. And they're just children. They're 12, 13 years old. And because they've learned how to read and write and they have some education, right after the Civil War, he takes his whole family down south to Natchez, Mississippi to open a school for newly freed people. Now, Again, he's, he's, been, he's not been free yet for a decade, and he's doing all of this. While he's here, he also founds the Black School for Ypsilanti, because Black students could go to Ypsilanti's public school, but had to sit in the back two rows of class. Now, did H.P. Jacobs forge his freedom papers and get here from St. Clair, Alabama, and his daughters here to have them sit in the back of somebody's classroom? Absolutely not. He did not. So H.P. Jacobs organizes Black families in Ypsilanti, to say either we have full access to education on our terms in your public schools or we want our own school, right? So always the first demand is no segregation at all. Second demand is you're gonna segregate us. We want as much self-determination and power over this process as possible, right? And so uh, the first black teachers, the first black principals in Michigan are in Ypsilanti. Uh, and they're at what is now the first ward school on South Adams Street. So he uh, also found Second Baptist Church while he's here. So this is the, we, we saw who was the founder of Brown Chapel AME. This is the founder of Second Baptist Church on, on Catherine and Hamilton. Uh, he returns south uh, after the Civil War and he founds that school. And that school is called Natchez Seminary and his young daughters teach in it. That school is now called Jackson State University. 
So the founder of Jackson State University, one of the most prestigious, important historical institutions of higher learning for black people in the United States, was the janitor at Eastern Michigan University. Right, so that really is the challenge of slavery. How many people who died on a plantation or and racism or were forced to be janitors really should have been leading schools? And how many white people leading schools probably should have been janitors, right? And, and that's really what we're seeing here. We're seeing that reality. And, and what that reality tells us is that racism and slavery destroys the, the ability for society to get its best from its best, right? So we're denying ourselves, and we'll see this over and over again, even for white races, they're denying themselves access to intelligent, competent people to make society better, right, by their racism. Uh, he uh, he uh, is part of the Mississippi Constitutional Convention. Less than a decade after he escapes from slavery, he is the sheriff of Natchez, Mississippi, and elected senator to Mississippi State uh, Constitutional Convention, where they will rewrite the Mississippi State Constitution on an anti-slavery basis. Black men could vote in Mississippi before they could vote in Michigan. Black men could vote in Mississippi before they could vote in Michigan. And he is one of the men who writes that into the Mississippi State Constitution. He also offers uh, a couple of very important legal things. One is to provide free public education for everybody in the South, right? Public education in this country, especially in the South, but all over, is a product of the Black liberation struggle. And we have public education because Black people demanded public ed education by and large. And so if you're poor, and white in Mississippi, and you know how to read and write, you can take an escaped slave named H.P. Jacobs, because without him, poor whites in Mississippi would have had no chance to learn how to read and write. And he also offered a bill uh, on uh, saying that you could not be, uh, uh, you could not be forced to work for debts owed. And this is how they were trying to re-enslave people in the South, because of course you got out of slavery with no cash, you immediately had to buy things, go into debt, and then you got re-enslaved to work off that debt. And so uh, he offered a bill saying no to that. Um, he also organizes the Mississippi Baptist Convention, the Jacobs ben Benevolence Association, all of these things. His daughters moved back up to Ypsilanti where they were live in Washtenaw County until the 1950s, some of them, believe it or not. So there are people alive today who would have known H.P. Jacobs' daughters. Uh, and they will stay here for their whole lives and raise their families here. Uh, H.P. Jacobs will return to this area many times over his life to speak at Emancipation Day demonstrations, to speak at political events, to visit his family, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 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 but one of the things you'll notice that Reverend H.P. Jacobs, what does he have at the end of his name? Because he was not done. He's done the religious work for his community. He's done the economic and political work and education work for his community. But he realizes at the age of 65 that bl the black body needs help that the black body needs assistance. So he goes to, he tries to actually go to medical school at U of M is denied. At the age of 65, he gets his medical degree from Louisville Medical School, a black medical school and becomes a medical doctor, right? So Reverend H.P. Jacobs is a medical doctor at the age of 65. This is a, this is the most important man or woman, black or white to ever live in Ypsilanti. They are a real leader of reconstructing this country after the Civil War. The reason those people aren't heroes to us, and the reason H.P. Jacobs doesn't have a statue, and, and, and Robert E. Lee does, is because H.P. Jacobs and Reconstruction lost, right? Jim Crow won. But there was a radical democratic moment in the South, far more radical and democratic than we have ever had in Michigan. Uh, for a few years before it was shut down by extreme white terrorist violence. Uh, a few years ago, um, Lynn Settles, uh, teacher, wonderful art teacher, uh, and I got together and were thinking about what to do. And one of the things um, uh, we did was we we started some murals. And so this mural is, or we, the, the, the students, uh, uh, Ypsilanti high school students, art students, started a number of murals on black and, and Ypsilanti history, and the first one they, they chose to do was H.P. Jacobs, and they did it on the last building of the old 
um, a black business district on Harriet Street, which is part two next week. Um, but so uh, Ypsilanti actually has one of the very few public monuments or murals or markers for a black leader of reconstruction anywhere in the country. And it's here in Ypsilanti. His daughter, uh, Anna Jacobs, would have taught music out of her room uh, or her house at 111 South Adams Street. His granddaughter, uh, Allie DeHazen Jacobs, uh, also taught music. So this was also a musical family. I love this family. I wish I could say more. But this is the, the sort of caliber of people we're talking about. Perhaps he's I mean, he's clearly more involved in all of this than, than other people, but he's the leader of many people who are like him, right? That's who, that's the black community that we're talking about. These are no pushovers. These are not pushovers. Okay. Uh, the 1863 Michigan Muller Colored Men's Convention. How important is Ypsilanti? During the Civil War after uh, January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation comes into effect and the Emancipation Proclamation doesn't free anybody as we know but it absolutely changes the character of the war. And the most important thing it does immediately is allow for the recruiting of black soldiers into the Union Army. Now, if you're gonna give black men guns, you're changing the equation. You're changing what this war is about. So yes, we can go, yeah, Lincoln, the emancipation didn't free anybody. It changed the character of the war. The war was now going to be fought despite what Lincoln intended, despite what the United States intended, but because of men like this, the war was now going to be fought to the death over slavery because black people had forced the issue with their feet in their tens of thousands in the South. And so uh, January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation comes into effect and black Michiganders and allies, not and, and black allies from around uh, uh, um, uh, the region come together to Michigan to discuss what to do about the Emancipation Proclamation and the war now that Black people can participate as soldiers in it. And so many of the leading figures of black, the Black period at the time, Martin Delaney, the father of Black nationalism, one of his many visits to Ypsilanti, this is George de Baptiste, this is William Whipper, they will all come, and H.P. Jacobs is the host of this meeting, they will all come to Ypsilanti to have this convention. And I can't read this whole convention, but you can see January 30th, 1863. And basically what it's saying is we want to fight. We want this country to win. We want the South to lose. But if we're going to join your army, you got to remove the word white from your constitution. And we want black officers and we're not taking, you know. And so think about that. That's, that's chutzpah. <laughs> These are black people who can't even vote. They're not, they have no legal rights. They are not citizens. By the, by the Dred Scott decision of 1857, and yet they're making demands on the U.S. government over their participation in the Civil War. These are not pushovers. These are revolutionaries who are trying to challenge and change the course of that Civil War to become a revolutionary war against slavery. Uh, and that's what happens. And Ypsilanti plays a role in that. Many people will know this image. This is the storming of Fort Wagner. Uh, July 1863 by the 54th Massachusetts Infantry, made famous in the movie Glory, starring Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman, and Matthew Broadway. Okay, it's a it's a pretty good movie. It's it's the best movie on the Civil War, which is not saying anything because all movies on the Civil War are terrible. But that's a that's the best one on it. And again, that I'm damning it with faint praise. But I encourage you to watch it. I also encourage young people to watch it. Um, I think it's an important history lesson, even though it gets some things right, some things wrong. Uh, but what happened was, uh, believe it or not, uh, many white officers thought that black soldiers were docile, that slavery had made them docile, and they would not fight in, in combat. And many were just racist and who refused to have black men with guns as leading charges, and rather to have black soldiers digging ditches and working fatigue duty and all of that kind of stuff. So it was a real challenge for black soldiers to be able to get into combat. This unit is led by very radical white abolitionist officers. There are no black officers with a few exceptions, which we can talk about at some other time. But by and large in the black units of the Civil War, they're led by white officers. Some of those white officers are just racist bigots who are careerists. And, and some of them are dedicated abolitionists who will die with their men, right? And, and one of those is, 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 Charles, is uh, Robert Gould Shaw right here, uh, who was a, a very, came from a wealthy abolitionist elite background in Boston, Massachusetts, 
and willingly gave his life in the struggle against slavery and is buried with the soldiers. So what happened was these black troops demanded the right to fight and they demanded the right uh, to prove that they would fight. And so July 1863, they win the right to charge an impregnable fortress, Fort Wagner. It cannot be broken into, but they win the honor of being the first to try to get through there, knowing it's a suicide mission, knowing it's a suicide mission. And Ypsilantians are right there, and Ypsilantians will play that, play that blood sacrifice to prove that black men would fight. About half the men who went uh, to charge Fort Wagner fell, uh, either dead, wounded, or captured. I can't tell you what it would mean to be captured by the Confederacy as a black soldier at the time. Uh, it was rough. Uh, if you weren't sold back into slavery, you might have been killed immediately. You might have been tortured. If you were lucky, you would have survived in a prison camp. Uh, so these are the men. This image that you're seeing hung over, it was fought at by Frederick Douglass. Um, the 54th Massachusetts was sort of the free black elite unit of the North. Frederick Douglass's children were in it. Sojourner Truth's grandson was in the 55th. Um, so uh, this, this, if you go to Frederick Douglass's house today, this hangs over his desk. This is the most iconic moment of the entire civil war for black people. And Ypsilanti is there, Ypsilanti is there. So Charles Augustus, he leaves a young wife on South Adams Street and uh, a young widow and a young orphan uh, on South Adams Street. Uh, so his, his wife, Louise Hayes, will be 19 when he leaves to go fight the Civil War and will have to raise that daughter on her own. Solomon Day, remember the Day family from early on, right? Napoleon Hamilton, John Leatherman is wounded at, at Wagner and is either executed right away or dies at Andersonville. Daniel Ross is wounded at a battle called Honey Hill. Elias Rouse, who's buried here in Highland Cemetery. And um, uh, House was over on Emmett and Ballard Street, was wounded at Wagner, and he lived his whole life here. He, uh, he married um, the widow of another person who died in the Civil War, and, and they raised those children together. Charles Scott was wounded at Wagner and then killed at one of the last battle of the war at Boykins Mill. In fact, that battle happens after the war is over. William Scott is wounded at Wagner. John Byrd died of disease. Uh, William Casey, who's the, another founder of Second Baptist Church. And if you look at him, he says he's 40 because 40 is the cutoff date to get in the army. He's actually 52. And he, most people were lying about their age to say they were older. He was lying about his age to say he was younger because he was so determined to go. Now, it turns out he was too old, 52 for a black man in the 1860s is old, right? And it turns out he was, he couldn't keep up with the rest of the troops. So he was the nurse for, the, for his unit for, um, for the whole of the Civil War. And his, his um, company, Company D, uh, uh, sent a petition to Abraham Lincoln demanding to equal pay with white soldiers and refusing to be paid any money at all. We're going to fight this war without any money until we can be paid uh, 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 the $13 a month that white soldiers are. Black soldiers will pay $10 a month. And uh, William Casey, the founder of, another founder of Second Baptist Church here in Ypsilanti, his name is the final name on the petition, written like John Hancock's, right, in this huge script. And I think what, what that, that his unit is saying is, He's the honorific. He's the oldest man. So his name is last and biggest. And his name was on the petition. He, he was illiterate, self-taught black man who escaped from slavery to become a lay preacher here in Ypsilanti. And he is the one who would spend all of his last years organizing to buy the lot at the corner of Hamilton and Catherine on which Second Baptist now is. So if you are a member of Second Baptist, next time you go into that church, know you're on a lot that was bought uh, through blood, sweat, and tears by a man who escaped from slavery and fought in the Civil War. Casey is one of our amazing people. There is a wonderful um, uh, obituary written about his life that you can read. Here's Ypsilanti's other Black Civil War soldiers, uh, dozens and dozens. So about 25% of white Ypsilanti men of, of fighting age went to fight in the Civil War. 75% of fighting age Black men from Ypsilanti went to fight in the Civil War. The Civil War was far, far, far more impactful in terms of overall on the community of black people than it was of white people. Even though the, in, our, in our minds, the Civil War is a white man's war, right? And it, and, and, it, and it was an attempt by
like these men here can make sure that that wasn't true. Uh, this is John Anderson. I could tell you a whole story about how he escaped from slavery. Uh, he's wonderful. His family still lives in Ypsilanti and uh, in Ann Arbor, and he escaped from slavery and then fought in the Civil War as well. Okay, so Ypsilanti is such a center of activity that that this is a place where Frederick Douglass comes three times. Ypsilanti is, I mean, we're talking about a community of five or 6,000 people at the time. Sometimes Ypsilanti, sometimes Douglass wouldn't even come to Detroit on his visits to Michigan and just come to Ypsilanti. Uh, so why does Douglass come to Ypsilanti three times? Because there is a black community here that is his constituency. That's why he's here. And, and, and you can see that. So at the, his, his last time he comes to Ypsilanti is all the way back or is it late, late, late in his life in 1888. And that's to try to get black people to continue to vote for the Republican Party. So he's coming, you know, even after the Republican Party has largely abandoned black people after the Civil War. So he's coming here to organize black public opinion. That's what he's coming here for. And if you look, look how much it is. This is from Hewitt Hall, Frederick Douglass. He speaks at Hewitt Hall. That's where the mix now is on the northeast corner of Washington, Michigan Avenue. And he's speaking on the assassination and its lesson. That's the assassination of Lincoln he's speaking on. And look how much seats are. 50 cents. Believe it or not, Frederick, Frederick Douglass could... He, people would pay more to see Frederick Douglass than almost any white man, you know, and yes, there is a, um, an, an exoticism to him and all of that, but the fact is Frederick Douglass was not just the leading black man at the time, he was this, one of the leading figures in, in all of America at the time, and he could command 50 cents a seat at a time, I mean, 50 cents at that time is two days wages or something like that, right, you know, so uh, it, it, no joke, Frederick Douglass coming here. And here on Friday evening, Frederick Douglass speaks in Ypsilanti and all desiring to go down to our neighboring city that evening and hear him can go for 25 cents for the round trip. About 100 have already signified their intention of going. That's Ann Arbor. This is when people used to come from Ann Arbor because the cool stuff was happening in Ypsilanti. Frederick Douglass used to speak here. Like, he did speak in Ann Arbor twice, once an extremely important time, but I don't have time to go into that discussion. Okay, the 15th Amendment, I don't have time to go into that either, uh, but it's important to say that the 15th Amendment uh, uh, um, gives black men, not black women or white women, but black men the right to vote. And so it reverses uh, Dred Scott, right? And it, it is federal policy. And so it means that black men can also serve on juries. They can give evidence in court. Uh, and so the 15th Amendment is a really important amendment. We have three amendments to the Constitution that came out in the Civil War. The 13th, which is extremely problematic. That's the amendment that uh, destroyed slavery, uh, but it also meant that you could be uh, forced to work for a crime, right? And we know what that means. So there, there, we actually need to rewrite the 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, which is the, the, by far the largest increase in democracy, the legal increase in democracy this country ever had, and that is that equal rights section and all of that. And then the 15th Amendment is um, to allow uh, black people the right to vote. So it took three, three amendments to the Constitution to get through the Civil War, and it would take actually a couple more. We actually haven't finished that process yet. We still need to do something about the Senate, the filibuster, the Electoral College, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that's really interesting in this, and you'll see these names, here's Mr. Brooks, right? So, there's, so this is 1863. Uh, John Brooks bought that farm in Pittsfield in the 1820s. This is 40 years after he bought that farm in Pittsfield, right? So this is a community that's here. Uh, this is not a picture of what happened in Ypsilanti, but if you read the report of what happened in Ypsilanti, it looks just like this, including people on horses and sashes and all of that. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to say here, here, like 28 ladies representing the 28 states who ratified the amendment, with Elizabeth Patton, a black woman personified as the goddess of liberty. Imagine seeing that coming down Ypsilanti streets in 1870. Um, and then the whole march in support of the 15th Amendment goes to the offices of Lyman Decatur Norris. Remember that Norris family. Lyman Decatur Norris was a racist Democratic congressman who was actually the lawyer for the family who owned Dred Scott. Not Dred Scott, but he actually worked on the case that got the Dred Scott decision for the slave owners. He was ideologically pro-slavery. 
literally this march goes to his house and in front of his house and office says, you don't get to say we don't have rights anymore. So they're calling out the, the white leaders of Ypsilanti to their face after the Civil War. Legal reconstruction, I don't have time to go into this, but it's really important to remember that along with social and economic and all reconstruction required a bunch of laws because there were a bunch of laws in place to not deny black rights. And, and we forget that, that this was codified. This was in our code. This was law. This wasn't practice. This wasn't racist white people. This was law in this country, right? And, it, and, and it's taken until now to, to reverse some of those laws. And it's not done yet at all. Uh, Post-war first. So, you know, it used to be when I was growing up, and I'm a little older now, but it used to be that, it, uh, you know, like the first black governor of Virginia since Reconstruction, right? It was the first black blank since Reconstruction. Because we all, and, and I always, what is, what is going on there? Well, it means that Reconstruction had a, a bunch of democratic moments in it that got destroyed by Jim Crow and racism for a hundred years. And then we're just getting back a little bit of what we had in terms of rights for everybody after the Civil War, when we say that. So sometimes when you think history just keeps going forward and forward and forward, it doesn't work that way. But look at these firsts, you know? So again, you go from no rights to black people being able to be a jury. And here we have a situation which is remarkable where it's an all, because it is a jury of your peers, because the case involves all black people, you know, the black uh, defendant and black plaintiff, the jury is all black in its land. Can you believe that? A jury of your peers. Uh, we wouldn't have a black juror again in Ypsilanti after the 1870s until the 1930s, the 1930s. So even in Ypsilanti, we have uh, 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 a remarkable moment the colored people of our city proposed to raise a poll Monday afternoon in honor of Grant and in memory of the great emancipator Abraham Lincoln near the West Public Square, which is uh, kind of near where the library is. So the Grant clubs in the South, they were called Union Leagues. Up North, they were called Grant Clubs, and they were kind of military formations, largely of ex-soldiers, and they were to defend the rights of Black men to vote. And Grant, at least in his first term, was considered extremely well, the, the most the most pro-black president we ever had by by a by a long shot uh, when Grant was was uh, president and Grant crushed the Klan in his first term. He allowed it to go on in the second term. But Grant was a real hero uh, for many black people because he also once Grant accepted black rights, he didn't go back on it. He went back on lots of other stuff, but he didn't go back on that. Okay. Uh, suffrage debates here in 1874, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, if everybody can see. So black men have won the right to vote. And Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, who is the most famous black woman of her day, she's a poet, a writer, an activist, a remarkable thinker, comes to Ypsilanti to speak at the AME church here. And she's going to speak with other black leaders, including men who fought in the Civil War. And she's going to demand that the black men who have won their right to vote use that right to vote to win the right to vote for black women and white women. And it says, every colored man and woman felt the full force of her remarks as she portrayed how when the dark shadow of slavery rested upon them, they mutually suffered and now being free, the justice and necessity of both clinging and rising together. So 1874, almost 50 years before the 19th Amendment passes, uh, giving uh, winning women the right to vote. And that passed during Jim Crow, so it didn't expand very much to black women. Uh, uh, but 50 years before that happens, Ypsilanti's black church, leading black church, is hosting uh, a rally to demand women have the right to vote. Uh, Emancipation Day is the most important day in the political calendar of black Ypsilanti and this whole region. It is the day, you know, we talk about Juneteenth now. I'm very glad that Juneteenth is being celebrated and recognized, but it has nothing to do with, with the history up here where people had their own traditions. Juneteenth was not celebrated in Michigan until the late 70s, first time it was celebrated, and not celebrated in Washtenaw County until the late 80s because we had our own tradition. 
uh, not connected with Texas, but Canada. And that was August 1st. And August 1st was by far the most important day in the political social calendar for black people. And even though it wasn't an official holiday because black Ypsilanti is such a large part of Ypsilanti, they refused to go to work on August 1st. And basically Ypsilanti shut down. So every white person knew that, yeah, August 1st is an unofficial holiday in Ypsilanti. Like literally stores don't work on August 1st. When they were building the water tower on August 1st, it didn't, nobody was there on August 1st because no black people showed up. And because no black people could show up to work, the white men couldn't do their work. So the work just shut down. So even though it wasn't an official holiday, black people treated it like an official holiday, literally taking off work, which is hard to do even now. And so it became an unofficial general holiday. Up here. Sometimes white politicians would come to curry black votes. Sometimes white politicians would come who were genuinely pro, pro black. Uh, but mainly this was a, a, a place for uh, reunions of political activity. And then eventually it became much more social much more social. Uh, and um, Emancipation Day would have been celebrated every year in Ypsilanti until the last of the second generation from slavery died. So maybe the 1930s, some, somewhere around there. Uh, here's some snapshots of social life. I don't have time to go into this, but there's a very, very rich social life. There are bands, there are theater. Even though black women aren't going to school, they're opening in their own homes the Ladies Lyceum. So the, the, there's the Louisa Hayes, who's the pastry cook at the Hawkins Hotel. She's a cook in a hotel. Her home is the headquarters of the Black Ladies Lyceum, where they get to together. And I'm serious. They read like Horace and Juvenal and Greek novels or and Greek history and French novels. They really, they, they are the highest level of sort of cultural discussions are happening at the, the pastry chef of Hawkins, you know, Hawkins Hotel's living room, right? Uh, so I think that's important. People, eat, if you're denied access to these institutions, you're going to create your own institution. And what we have is Ypsilanti creating their own institution. Here's real snapshots from that period. These are all people from the 1880s, 1890s who lived in Ypsilanti. I know some of their names. I don't know other of their names. Let me give a couple of them. This is Wealtha Sherman. This is um, Mary Delaney McCoy. This is Elijah McCoy's wife. And let me, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to let you in on a secret. Elijah McCoy is an extremely important person. His wife, far more important. So if you want to, if you really want to learn about the McCoys, okay, Elijah's great. His wife, Mary Delaney McCoy, who also lived in Ypsilanti, they were married here at Brown Chapel, um, is, is a more important historical figure and she deserves much more recognition. This is George Kersey. These are the Freeman girls, and their father was a sharecropper on a farm that is kind of near uh, Prospect Park is today, believe it or not. So this picture is taken over on Old Forest Avenue in front of their farm. This is Egbert Bow. This is Silas Day. Okay, the end of Reconstruction. Shifted national politics, the end of civil war alliances. I don't have all time to go in this, but that moment where black people are, are really participating in life and even running for office, getting candidates elected, even if it's not directly, uh, uh, that comes to a crashing end by about 1890. Uh, imperialism also happens, which is the United States enters the world stage. The Spanish-American War happens. The United States invades the Philippines. So the United, and this is also that period in the 1890s where racism becomes um, scientific, right? It's not just in the Bible, it's in your genes. And it's a scientific uh, uh, racism that becomes very predominant in this period. And uh, us historians call, th call this period the nadir, like the lowest ebb, the most racist moments in American history, believe it or not, uh, around this period. And it's, it's it has to do with the, the, the destruction of Reconstruction, the uh, reemergence of white supremacist governments in the South, and the American uh, the, the, the crushing of the American labor movement, which killed thousands of people in the 1870s, and then um, the emergence on the world stage as an imperial power. And how do you justify that? Um, Ypsil Ypsilanti becomes increasingly segregated. So it didn't go from really segregated at the beginning and then black Ypsilanti and progressive whites chipped away at it. And made, no, it was 
Ypsilanti is far, far more segregated today in terms of where people lived than it was during slavery. Far more segregated today in terms of where people live uh, than it was in the 1850s, right? So we don't always make progress. There's a noticeable uh, shift in language among whites. If you read the newspaper, there are no longer uh, <clears throat> articles talking about black people outside of crime. Right. That's that's where you will see Ypsilanti. If I want to learn about Ypsilanti's extremely large 30 percent black population, I can't read an Ypsilanti newspaper. I have to read the Pittsburgh Courier, a black newspaper from Pittsburgh, which will have a whole Ypsilanti section or the Chicago Defender, which will have a, a whole Ypsilanti section. So na national black newspapers will pay attention to Ypsilanti in this period in a way that the local white newspaper simply will not. Um, so that, that tells you a lot about what you need to know. Uh, education opportunities are important. Black people come to Ypsilanti uh, to go to Cleary College, which was a business school, which does allow for black admittance, and then the normal college. So uh, if you're a black person, you can go to school at the normal college, a black woman, but you can only teach at a black school, right? A white woman can teach at a black school, but a black woman can only teach at a black school. So you are very limited. To where you can teach. So if you're a black woman, and even if you're from Ypsilanti and you go to the normal college to get a job, you're going to have to go to Nashville or something like that. You're not going to be able to work anywhere around here. Um, so so um, we do see women, black women from around the country, but a lot of women from here uh, who have access because their parents work there or something like that to go to the normal college and then go on from the normal college to become teachers other places. The man who heads the Urban League in Chicago becomes a doctor, a black man who's one of the most important black men of Chicago in the 1920s is, is, is from that kind of tradition. Okay, uh, Canada, a lot of uh, people who, you know, the Canada is where the black farmers live. And Ypsilanti is the town those black farmers' children come to to look for jobs, right? So just like white farmers' kids are moving from the farm to the city to get a job in the factory, same is true with black farmers' kids. And those black black farmers around here live in Canada. And so men, so Ypsilanti sees an influx of, of people coming in from Canada, which really isn't a different country as much as it's the same community. Isolation of the community from formal politics means that the community has to create its own institution in politics. So we see these wonderful social organizations, the ancient United Knights and Daughters of Africa, the Knights of Pythias, the Independent Order of Good Samaritans. These are all black, fraternal and sorority organization, mutual benefit and mutual aid organization that develop in Ypsilanti for black people to pull their resources together to help out in times of sickness or whatever. These are incredibly important organizations uh, and will become the center of black political life in Ypsilanti for a generation or two during this Jim Crow period. Okay, Jim Crow and Ypsilanti. Jim Crow is real in Ypsilanti. It is not codified by violence the way it is in the South or law the way it is in the South, but it is real. I don't have time to go into all of this, but I, one of the things I want you to imagine is a polite Southern town, okay? Not uh, Oxford, Mississippi, but Asheville, North Carolina. That's Ypsilanti. It's still a Southern town. And, and, and so, like you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't put a notice up saying no N-word allowed, but everybody in town would know, no black people are going into that place, all right? And, and so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't in your face, but it was just as rigid in many ways, just as rigid. Uh, but importantly, and I think this is true, importantly, it is not backed up by the kind of mass violence that you see in the South. We just have, we have very little of that. There are one or two lynchings in the North or in Michigan, um, but we, we do see relatively little of that kind of cultural uh, racist violence in the in that period in Ypsilanti, which is, I mean, and we're talking about a country awash with that, right? So Ypsilanti is racist, but it's not, it's, it's not a place you're gonna get your house burned down, right? It's a place you can't go to the bowling alley, but it's not a place you're gonna get, you're gonna get lynched. Uh, I think that's one way to think about it. Shall we draw the color line? This is talked about openly and we're coming to the end of this. This is the uh, Ladies Literary Club. And I think this sums up kind of what happens to the black community in Ypsilanti during the 1880s and 1890s. 
And the Ladies Literary Club, which is an all white middle class ladies, you know, no, no offense to anybody here if they're with the, if they work with the Ladies Literary Club. It's a wonderful organization, but it, it's very much a white middle class women's organization in Ypsilanti. And they decided to have a discussion like every other organization in the United States. Shall we draw the color line? I mean, they already drew the color line. There were no black women in this thing, but they're openly talking. Should we formalize the color line? Uh, in, in, in this is 1901. And this is in the news. This is not hidden behind. This is openly talked about. And this wonderful black woman who I wish we knew her name writes into the newspaper and says a colored woman writes of the city writes as follows to the editor in regard to the recent discussion of the ladies literary club as to whether or not the Federation of Women's Club should draw the color line editor. And this is a woman from Ypsilanti. Before you draw the color Ooh. line, I think it well to call a meeting to see if the colored ladies would care to join with the white women or not in their women's club. I don't think that there is one of the colored ladies who has asked you if they could become a member of your club. The colored ladies have a society of their own and they don't consult the white ladies about it and don't ask them to become members. The colored people of Ypsilanti have made themselves. The ladies in the literary club must remember that this in forward. I think that says it all. The colored people of Ypsilanti have made themselves in the face of your racism, right? That says so much. And that leads to this, Black Lives Matter in Ypsilanti in the 1890s. How hard is it to get a white police officer arrested and charged with murdering a black man in custody today? Well, we've had, we've had uprisings in this country because it's so hard to do, right? Today, so hard to do. When it's live on television, when it's, when it's like an open murder on television, yeah, are they going to charge him or not? So if it's hard to do now, in the 1890s, in that Nader period, how hard was it? Black Ypsilanti was able to get the white leading officer, <clears throat> Officer Eaton, arrested and charged with murder in Ypsilanti of a black man, George Griffith, in custody in the 1890s. And uh, so we can see here a meeting attended by two or 300 colored people of the city at their hall on Buffalo. So the social, the Good Samaritan social hall, where we talked about the life of community is and this this building is still there on the corner you can imagine all the people meeting in there uh the the, pre, the reverend john l davis pastor of the ame church presided a good deal of indignation was, was expressed over the arrest and death of griffin and considerable wild talk indulged as what would be done people were angry mr davis however tells us that the intemperate councils were not approved by the majority and that they only desire a legal at investigation to ascertain if griffin was unjustifiably treated so Black Ypsilanti is, calls in Augustus Straker, the leading black, well, the leading black lawyer in the country, but he's in Detroit at the time, and he comes to Ypsilanti, and they're able to convince the judge that Ypsilanti is so racist that you need to move this trial to a less racist town. And that less racist town, and anybody from this area will laugh at this, is South Lyon. South Lyon is going to be less racist than Ypsilanti, and therefore the jury is going to give a fair shake to, to, and this was considered a big victory by the black prosecutor that they were able to get this. Now, for years, they were in this trial. Officer Eaton was acquitted, right? And the city gladly hired him back onto the force. We could imagine that happening, right? But I think it would be almost impossible for us to imagine in 1890s a black community in a small city like Ypsilanti getting a white police officer arrested and charged for murdering a black man. That says everything I think that we need to, I mean, that underlines the power of this community. This community is a community birthed in the struggle, struggle against slavery, in the struggle for freedom, birthed on the Underground Railroad, grew up in the Civil War and Reconstruction, and came to maturity in all of those, after all of those experiences in Jim Crow, with their heads held high, right? Now, eventually, and we'll get into part two next time, we'll get down a little bit. But by the 1890s, what a remarkable thing uh, to be able to happen. Now, Officer Eaton would continue his racist attacks on black people. And we see uh, that summer of 1891 was Ypsilanti's long, hot summer. There was almost a riot where Eaton literally deputizes every white person on the street and tries to get them to go to the South Side to arrest two black children. 
uh, and then blah, blah, blah. There's big to-dos and ta-das around that. But so Eaton was clearly a racist cop, and Ypsilanti wasn't having it. Ypsilanti wasn't having it. Unfortunately, he retired with his full pension from here. You can see pictures of the guy. He looks just like you would imagine him looking. And this is race in the landscape, and this is our last slide for tonight. So <clears throat> what we're looking at uh, on the top right is the percentage of black population in Ypsilanti. So the full black population and then the percentage of that black population living in each ward in Ypsilanti. So historically there were five wards in Ypsilanti. First, second, and third on the west side of the Huron River with first being the south side of Ypsilanti and uh, fourth and fifth being the east side of the river. You can see in 1860 not a single you know, the first ward is not the place with the most African Americans. Not a single ward predominates. Not a single ward has more than double any other ward. In fact, there are Black people living more or less all over town, right? And then look as we go forward. And this big jump here, 1880 to 1894, and you can see in the this ward here, the fourth ward, that's Depot Town. That's when Black people were driven out of Depot Town in the 1890s, literally by uh, by burning down black uh, tenement housing, which was behind sidetrack. So segregation was both, you know, forced segregation and and kind of institutional social segregation. But in the 1860s, here it is, and then by 1920, about 94 percent of all black people lived in the South Side, the first ward of Ypsilanti. So Ypsilanti in the Civil War, not segregated, at least in terms of neighborhoods where people live. By the end of World War I, it's completely segregated. It's <laughs> as segregated as any town in the South. And what we're looking at here is a map of what the South of Ypsilanti looks like today. And this would be a map of 1910, of families, Black families in, living in Ypsilanti. So the red diamonds are where Black families live. The blue diamonds are where Black schools, institutions, businesses are. And then the green is uh, where black domestic women work, uh, domestic servants work uh, in house of white, uh, largely white families. So one of the, what I want, and then we have this big empty space. So this is that area around South Adams and uh, Buffalo where the churches and school are. And this is the first sort of center of black life in Ypsilanti. And if you notice where it is, it seems like it's right south of downtown now, but in the 1860s, this was the very edge of town. So it's black people making their church and school on the very edge of town. And then as people come back from Canada, or not back from Canada, come from the city, from the rural areas in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and these people are actually coming with a little money in their pocket, right? They've, they've had a farm for a couple of generations. And so you see the houses on First and Second Avenue off of Michigan Avenue, many of those will be owned by black people very early on, where black people will own lots. And in this area, black people will rent from white owners. But in this area where black people have accumulated some money from owning land in Canada, they're able to buy property here. So many of the houses on First and Second Avenue will be um, uh, uh, homeowner uh, uh, houses. And then, and the reason this isn't filled in yet is because this is just when the great migration is going. And so this Monroe, Madison, all of those president named streets south of Harriet, um, uh, that will be filled in in the next 20 years after 1910. So we see first big migration, very edge of town. Second, very edge of town with a big empty space between it. Third, very edge of town with that big empty space between it. This big empty space will become Ainsworth subdivision, which will be a whites-only subdivision. We'll talk about that next week. The last thing I wanted to show is these green dots of domestic workers. And you notice Black women aren't working on the east side of town. They're working over here. Are there no rich white people on the east side of town? What's going on? Well, on the, it's really interesting. On the, this side of town, the wealthier people who would have the maids are generally German immigrants who have immigrated yeah, in the last couple of generations. And to prove how much of an American these immigrants are, they hire as servants Irish immigrants. So if I were to do a map and show you where Irish women were working, they would all be working in these German homes over here. They don't hire black women.
But all these liberal college professors over here, they hire black women. So where black and white women work in terms of the landscape doesn't say anything about them. It says a whole lot about this, the class and social needs and, and whatever of the people employing them. So just like, you know, if, if I buy a Lexus or a Prius, that Prius or Lexus says two different things about me. If I hire a new immigrant or a black woman, that also says different things about me, right? And, and so one of the things we're seeing here with where black women are working is the class and cultural division among white people. How interesting is that? Also, I want you to notice where the highway is and where the city dump is. And all of those will be part of next week's part two. This last picture I want you to notice, this is the, the, the sister of Elijah McCoy, Anna McCoy. She owned a hairdressing shop right on, um, on uh, 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 Michigan Avenue. This is not a poor person's house. They did okay. The McCoys were, were rather uh, well off. Beautiful house. This is right where the Mishworks is on Harriet Street. So if you know where Mishworks is on Harriet Street, that's where Anna McCoy's beautiful house was. And this um, picture is in Friedman's Progress, a, a book about uh, the 50th anniversary of the end of the Civil War. And it, it's kind of a Booker T. Washington, look how well we're doing, how, how well we've advanced. And they were trying to highlight Black homeowners. And so they actually list all the Black homeowners in Ypsilanti in this book, which is a great read source for us. Okay, that was uh, 100 years in, I don't know, two hours. I know that I, I didn't get through a lot of it, but I hope that gave you some sense of Ypsilanti's early Black history. And, and then that's going to be really important to bring this story in to next time uh, when we'll bring it to a little, we'll bring it to urban renewal more or less, uh, not all the way up to now, but to urban renewal. So thank you everybody for joining uh, tonight. And if you have questions or comments, I would be happy, or Lisa hopefully will be happy